Hello, my name is Thomas Scheren from uh, the University Medical Center in Groningen in the Netherlands. Um, and I would like to welcome you to this webinar, uh, thankfully organized by the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine. It's on fluids in the ICU. And I'm very happy that we have two excellent uh, speakers today, which do not need uh, really much of an uh, introduction. Um, and these are the uh, speakers: this is uh, uh, Jean, Professor Jean-Louis Teboul from Paris and Professor Anders Perner from Copenhagen. Um, and we will uh, talk about fluids in the ICU. As I said, uh, these are our learning uh, objectives um, to understand why and when it's important to predict fluid responsiveness and to know the place and limit of the new indices to test fluid responsiveness. Uh, and uh, we'll also look at the guidelines of the surviving sepsis campaign to see what they uh, recommend us and how we can interpret the evidence for lower versus higher uh, fluid volume or restrictive or li more liberal. Um, and we will end up with a simplified approach uh, for fluid therapy in uh, septic shock. Now, uh, let me give you a little background um, from the perioperative setting. We know that um, hypovolemia is a bad thing and hypervolemia is also a bad thing. So if you give too less fluids, it's not good. If you give too much fluid, it's also not good. As you can see here, so there's a, a U-shaped relation between uh, the state of the volume state of the patient and the morbidity. So uh, as we said, uh, hypovolemia is, uh, increases the risk of organ hypoperfusion, sepsis, and multiple organ failure, but also hypervolemia, which we certainly also agree we would not uh, uh, want uh, because it increases the risk of edema and pulmonary complications. This is just a theoretical uh, assumption, you might say, but it's supported by data. This is a study we did uh, some years ago with colleagues from Boston, uh, looking at more than 92,000 patients from the perioperative setting, and we divided them into five quintiles according to the uh, amount of fluids that they got. So Q1 is the, the ones that get the, the, the least fluid, and Q5 is the ones that get the most fluids. And we looked at the association between fluid volume and, and different outcomes like mortality, pulmonary complications, acute kidney injury, length of stay, and hospital costs. And you can see that this theoretical U-shaped relation that I just showed you is actually can actually be found in real patient data, uh, as you can see here, more or less. So less fluid volume, uh, less uh, fluid administration is particularly uh, associated with acute kidney injury and, and uh, hypervolemia is associated with uh, increased length of stay and uh, mortality as you can see here. So the question is, um, the second problem is the variability of um, uh, fluid administration. So this is also data from the perioperative, se uh, perioperative setting to university hospitals, and they looked at non-complicated surgeries with minimal blood loss, and they looked at the variability of fluid administration between different care providers and between different types of operations. And this is what they found. So this is a huge variability in fluid administration uh, between the different uh, types of surgery. Let's just look uh, at a pedectomy, a very small surgery. And you can see here that uh, people and the patients got between five and 14 milliliter per kilogram or five, 400 uh, to 1200 milliliters of fluids per hour. And, and this is the editorial that was uh, accompanied. Uh, sorry, this is the conclusion um, uh, uh, that they uh, wrote, wrote from this paper. So a large patient variability in fluid administration. Um, and, and this is the editorial that was accompanied with an article where they reinforced that uh, patients uh, undergoing, for example, a 75 kilogram patient undergoing a four hour procedure could receive anything between 700 milliliters and 5.4 liters for the same uh, of, of crystalloids uh, for the same uh, uh, surgery 
depending on their anesthesia pro provider, they call this a random chaos. And we all know that uncontrolled variation is the enemy of quality. Uh, what about the intensive care setting? Um, we know from the Fenice trial, uh, who's, who has looked at more than 2,000 patients uh, in, in Europe, um, to evaluate the type and the amount of fluids uh, and the uh, triggers that were used to, to give these fluids. And these were the results from that study. I, I'm sure that Professor Taboul will uh, also deep dive into this. But as you can see here, 43% of the, of the doctors did not even look at any variable uh, prediction of fluid responsiveness. Uh, and the, a third looked at static variables uh, like central venous pressure, which is not a, a useful uh, a measure of predicting fluid responsiveness, and only a minority looked at the dynamic variables, which I'm sure we will hear about uh, in the talk of Professor Taboul. And more importantly, even if those doctors identified that the patient will be in need of fluids, um, so the fluid prediction was positive, um, 50% uh, did still give fluids, 50% uh, did not give fluids, and 50% and, and, and were, were uns unsure. So regardless of the test, uh, the doctors did not care about the results of that test uh, in, times of, in terms of giving fluids. So we have a problem, and uh, today we will solve part of these problems with these two experts and we will start with professor Jean-Louis Teboul from Paris um, and he will uh, tell us how we can predict uh, the response to fluids and he will focus on what's new in that uh, topic. Please uh, Jean-Louis give us your talk. Thank you very much uh, Thomas. Uh, so good afternoon everyone. I'm very happy to to talk about assessment of fluid responsiveness, what's new, and I would like to, to thank a lot uh, the cardiovascular dynamic section of the ESICM for this invitation, and in particular, Professor Xavier Monet. So what's new? First, my conflicts of interest on this slide. Be before saying what is new, I would like to give some definitions of fluid responsiveness. Fluid responsiveness is uh, defined as a capacity of the heart to significantly increase its rock volume or cardiac output in response to a volume challenge. And I like to refer to the Frank Starling uh, mechanism with stroke volume on the y axis and ventricle preload on the x axis. As you know, the relationship is not linear, but curvy linear. And if you increase preload, for example, by giving fluid to the patient, stroke volume increases only if the heart of the patient or the ventricle of the patient is working on the steep part of the Frank Starling curve. If you increase preload by giving volume while the heart or the ventricle of the patient is working on the flat part of the Frank Starling curve, you have no increase in stroke volume, and this condition is called preload unresponsiveness. So fluid infusion will increase LV stroke volume only if both ventricles are preload responsive. So fluid responsiveness, which is um, a clinical concept, is equivalent to biventricular preload responsiveness, which is a more uh, physiological concept. So now why? Why to assess fluid responsiveness? Already uh, Thomas Sharon told you uh, that uh, there is an optimal uh, fluid therapy, and when we give too much fluid, it's not good, not enough is not good. This is the, uh, the main reason, of course. I would say that not all patients, even in shock, are fluid responsive. And I want to refer to this uh, old paper we did in the past with Sir Farik Michard where we pulled all the studies that, uh, that address the issue of fluid responsiveness in patients with, who, who were in shock. And we had a surprise, at that time a surprise, not, not, now it's not a surprise, that only 52% of patients increased their cardiac output in response to fluid administration, meaning that 48% did not. Another reason 
is that free responsiveness is a dynamic phenomenon which can evolve over time. And this is well illustrated by this study. You know this study, the Andrew Miller Shock Study by Glenn Hernandez and co-workers. It is a multicenter randomized control trials uh, comparing two strategies in the initial resuscitation of septic shock, one based on uh, perfusion markers like upper field time and one based on the decrease in lactate. But interestingly, in this study, uh, uh, the investigators also uh, could use fluid responsiveness indices. And interestingly, 82% of the patients uh, finally were guided using fluid responsiveness indices. And interestingly, at age zero, just at the inclusion time, at inclusion time, the majority were fluid responsive. Just to say that 80, 18 by definition were, uh, there were in 18 patients, there was percent, sorry, we had no assessment of fluid responsiveness, but in the 82%, at the beginning, 70% were fluid responsive and 30% non-responsive, but they know that uh, at the inclusion time, they already received the fluid before uh, uh, the inclusion the, in the uh, study. But after two hours, only 28% were fluid responsive, four hours, 15%, and after 13%, and 4% after eight hours. So illustrating the fact that fluid responsiveness is not a fixed uh, uh, phenomenon, it is a, a dynamic phenomenon. So this is why we need to assess frequently fluid responsiveness. Another reason is that fluid infusion could be uh, risky in non-responders, and finally, fluid overload is, in general, harmful. This is well illustrated by the study by Jean-Louis Vincent and co-workers, uh, the SOAP study in the past, showing that the cumulative, a positive community fluid balance was an independent factor associated with mortality, and this study was replicated many, many times in many uh, in various uh, settings, clinical settings. So we can say that fluid overload is not good, as said by Thomas. And another reason to assess fluid responsiveness is simply because the use of fluid responsiveness tests uh, was demonstrated to be associated with improved outcome. And this is well illustrated by this recent study, I would say, coming from Argentina and Arnaldo Dubin as the first author. It is a, a multi-center prospective cohort study. It is not a randomized study, just a, a prospective cohort study in many patients with, sep with sepsis. And interestingly, uh, the use of dynamic tests of field responsiveness was an independent factor associated with survival, with survival. So simply the use of dynamic tests. So it is interesting to keep this in mind. And this is another uh, paper, meta-analysis of studies that uh, compared uh, the use of dynamic measures of uh, fluid responsiveness to uh, standard care, I would say, control group using CVP and MAP for guiding fluid resuscitation. And there was an improvement in, uh, in outcome in terms of mortality, but also ICU stay, et cetera, in patients who had uh, dynamic measures of fluid responsiveness as a, a guidance of free therapy. So there is no doubt about this. It is very useful to assess fluid responsiveness. So now when? when to assess fluid responsiveness. Uh, the surviving sepsis campaign uh, guidelines, are uh, the last version of this in 2021, recommend to give uh, at least 30 ml per kilogram of IV fluids within the first three hours without any uh, predictor of fluid responsiveness, just giving 30 ml per kilogram and see what happens. For me, uh, there is a risk of under-resuscitation in some patients who need more, but on the opposite, there is a risk of over-resuscitation in some other patients. For example, patients with uh, pneumonia, with uh, cardiovascular comorbidities who don't, don't need uh, too much fluid, they are not necessarily dehydrated, uh, 
And in this patient, it could be risky to give this amount of fluids. So one size does not fit all, of course. And also reassessing after three hours uh, seems to be very late uh, for me. So in septic shock, at least, given that hypovolemia is present in 100% of patients, it is logical to infuse a feed bolus early without using any predictor of your responsiveness. It is important to be smart, but not too much, and don't waste too much time. But I would start not by 30 ml per kilogram for three hours, but by 10 ml per kilogram crystalloids within the first hour. But this is just a starting infusion rate. Of course, we need to give more if there is, uh, is our evident free losses, for example, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, et cetera or abdominal sepsis, which is in general associated with a, a more a profound hypovolemia. Also, muttering or increased carburetal time, which are generally associated with low calicalco due to hypovolemia in this context of septic shock, or low pulse pressure, which is a marker of stroke volume. Of course, we can decrease the infusion rate in case of worsening of tachypnea, fall in oxygen saturation, for example. So, I would mean that it is important to individualize the initial free therapy on clinical uh, markers. But if shock persists, it is important now to test preload responsiveness after maybe 45 minutes or uh, one hour, if shock persists only. So how to assess free responsiveness now? I like to refer to the Frank Starling curve, but I said, uh, I, I, I already talked about this, but in fact, there is not one unique Frank Starling curve, but a family of curves between a normal heart and a failing heart. And therefore, if you measure preload by whatever you want, this value of preload can be associated with preload responsiveness or preload unresponsiveness. So it, we cannot use these so-called markers of preload or static markers of preload, we can, which cannot reliably predict for responsiveness. And this was demonstrated by many, many, many studies for CVP, POP, or uh, BNP, or maybe uh, some measures of the size of, uh, of the ventricles using echocardiography, et cetera. This is why now the international societies, the consensus on shock uh, coming from the ESICM as well as the um, uh, SSC guidelines, recommend or suggest to use dynamic over static variables to predict full responsiveness. So, what is a dynamic variable now? This is something which can quantify the slope of the Frank Starling curve at the time you decide to give a treatment to your patient. And in fact, there are different categories, passive everything test and expiratory occlusion test in patients who receive mechanical ventilation. And also uh, indices related to respiratory variation of stroke volume Pulse pressure variation or stroke volume variation. I would like to just to underline the fact that passive aggression tests and anti-expiratory aggression tests are very interesting because they can mimic they can mimic a free challenge because you increase preload with this test. And for example, for passive aggression test test. It is a postural maneuver which can transfer blood from the legs and the abdominal compartment towards the intratorsic compartment. And therefore, this should mimic a fleet challenge. It is like a prelude challenge. And this is well illustrated by the study we did with Laurent Guerin and Xavier Bonnet in the past. We showed that PLR, passive leg raising, increases the mean systemic pressure in prelude responders and in prelude non responders. PLR increases CVP in preload responders and in preload non responders. But PLR increases the venous return pressure gradient, the difference between mean pressure and CVP, 
and increases color output only in preload responders. This is exactly as fluid infusion does. So we can say that PLR mimics a fluid challenge. It is an internal uh, fluid challenge, if you want. So we need to assess the hemodynamic response to PLR to predict fluid responsiveness. It's very simple, in fact, and this works very well. This is a meta-analysis we did in the past with Xavier Monet and Paul Merrick. We included 21 clinical studies that address the issue of fluid responsiveness predicted by PLR and almost 1,000 patients. And we showed that the changes in CALACA output during PLR can well predict fluid responsiveness with an excellent area under the rock curve. The undisputed occlusion test also is a preload challenge which can increase preload. And therefore, if you measure stroke volume at the same time or calico at the same time, you can have the answer of your question is my patient fluid responsive or not? And the idea is to interrupt the ventilator. Of course, the patient needs to be ventilated at the end. Uh, at the end of expiration for 15 seconds, and this can increase preload presently, and you can identify pre-responders by patients who increase their calic output or stroke volume at the same time. And this is a meta-analysis we did with Francesco Gavelli, Oishi, Xavier Monet, etc., where we pulled 13 studies that address the issue of uh, prediction of flow responsiveness using this and expertogen test. And we found a very good area under the rock curves upon 91 with a good sensitivity and good specificity, but a low threshold value, 5% only. So you need to, to use a very precise technique to measure calic output. The major limitation of these two tests, passive aggressing test and an expertogen occlusion test is that you need a real-time stroke volume or character measurements, and this is mandatory. For example, for passive grazing, we also looked at the changes in atoll pressure and the area of the uh, under the rock curve for the prediction of uh, fluid responsiveness uh, was not so good if you use only the response of atoll pressure, pulse pressure here. Uh, the area is only is upon 77, which is good, but not enough compared to the changes in calic output because we found a lot of false negative cases. Also, you cannot use the changes in CVP during PLR. This is a paper we, we did with uh, Alpha Mzawi and others. And we looked at the change in CVP instead of the change of calic output. And in fact, it didn't work at all. So we cannot rely on the change in CVP during passive black rising to detect pre responsiveness within the calic output monitor. This is why uh, it is interesting to look at the respective variation of stroke volume measured by pulse pressure variation, because in this case, you don't need any calibrate monitor. PPV, you need, you need only an natural line to do this. And you have to look at the changes of stroke volume, mainly pulse pressure, which is a mark of stroke volume, during the uh, respiratory cycle. And the idea behind is that the more the stroke volume changes during the mechanical ventricle, mechanical ventricle uh, ventilation cycle, the more likely the patient's heart is preload responsive. And this does not need any uh, catalog measurement because a simple auto line is uh, possible. And as you know, high pulse pressure variation as a marker of a high stroke volume variation uh, generally is associated with preload responsiveness with, if we refer to the frank Stalin curve and the low pulse pressure variation is uh, uh, is associated with prod unresponsiveness. And you have this uh, in patients who are mechanically ventilated with at least 8 ml per kilogram tidal volume. Please don't give fluid to your patient. And it works very well in this kind of patients. This is an old study we did with Farik Misha and others in my unit. And we show that PPV was far better than CVP and POP to predict the responsiveness in patients with septic shock and ventilated with at least 8 ml per kilogram type of volume. The issue is that there are many circumstances in ICU patients where 
Uh, PPV does not work very well because of the presence of false positive or false negative cases. Uh, Read me out, low tidal volume ventilation, uh, spontaneous building activity. And this is why we need other tests. And we can use the changes of PPV during a tidal volume challenge or passive aggressive test. And in case of low tidal volume ventilation, PPV does not work very well. This is well illustrated by this study by Laurent Muller and co-workers, uh, who showed a low sensitivity of PPV to predict fluid responsiveness during low tidal volume ventilation, meaning that you could have some fluid responders with a low tidal with a low PPV, uh, and this could be uh, a low sensitivity. This is why, with Sheila Maitra from Mumbai, India, and others. We propose to increase tidal volume transiently for, for one minute only from six to eight ml per kilogram. And now we obtain very good results in terms of prediction of fluid responsiveness. Eight ml per kilogram was better than six in terms of area under the rock curve, but what was far better was the change in PPV. And we found a cutoff value of 3.5%, meaning that if PPV increases by more than 3.5%, for example, from 7 to 11%, the patient would be fluid responsive. And this is very interesting because again and again, uh, you can use this test in the absence of cardiac output monitoring device. And in my experience in COVID-19 ARDS patients, it was very helpful because these patients are in good conditions for interpretation and interpretation of PPV, except of course tidal volume. And with Temisto Takeri, Francesco Gavelli, and uh, Rishi and Xavier Monet in my unit, we uh, more recently confirmed these results. And in patients with low tidal volume ventilation, we confirm that an increase in pulse pressure variation during the tidal volume challenge is reliable to predict the responses. And this was confirmed by others. This is a study by Antonio Messina, Maurizio Cecconi, who also showed that the change in PPV or change in SVV during the tidal volume challenge uh, predicted fluid responsiveness far better than the baseline value of PPV and SVV in the setting of operating room in patients who receive a low tidal volume ventilation, and also in patients during prone position in prone neurosurgical patients, again in the operating room, and again the change in PPV during tidal volume change work very well compared to PPV alone or SVV alone with an excellent area under the rock curve. And we confirm this in a, in a paper which is not yet published, but in revision with uh, Dr. Huishi and others in my unit, we show that during prone position uh, and low tidal volume ventilation, the change in PPV during the tidal volume challenge uh, far better predicted fluid responsiveness than the baseline value of PPV. Also, you can use passive lag raising and the change of pulse pressure variation during passive lag raising. This is an alternative to use a catacult monitor. And with Temistock Takeri again, recently, we also showed that the decrease in pulse pressure variation during passive lag raising was reliable to predict fluid responsiveness with an excellent area under the rock curve. So you can also use this during low tidal volume ventilation. It is again very helpful because this does not require any cardiac root monitoring device. And with Alpha Mzawi again, more recently, we tried to show the predictive value of the change in PPV during PLR in patients who were mechanically ventilated, but who had some spontaneous breathing activity. And we found an area under the rock curve of 0 0.78, better than the baseline PPV here. Of course, it is not perfect, but in this kind of patients who had some, uh, some spontaneous breathing activity, it could be very useful because, again, it does not need any cardiac root monitoring device. So my conclusion is that PLR and index perturbation test mimic free challenge without the need of infusing any drop of fluid 
The changes in cardiac output in response to this test were shown to reliably predict for responsiveness in various situations. PPV has the advantage of not requiring cardiac output monitoring, but it is not interpretable as a predictor of your responsiveness in several situations encountered in the ICU. An increase in PPV during tidal volume challenge in supine or in prone position, or a decrease in PPV during PLR can be helpful to predict your responsiveness in patients ventilated with low tidal volume. And the major advantage of this novel test using dynamics of PPV is to be used with a simple atoll line. But don't forget that even in case of field responsiveness, it is important to assess the benefit risk ratio of fluids before any infusion, especially in patients with associated ARDS. The benefit can be assessed by the degree of field responsiveness, not only the presence, but the degree of field responsiveness. And the risk can be assessed by indices of lung tolerance. You can choose whatever you want, PF ratio, lung water, POP, B lines, et cetera. I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Louis, for this excellent overview over the available tests and the new tests, especially to assess if a patient is indeed fluid responsive and will benefit from fluid administration. Of course, uh, you all can ask questions and we will answer the questions, uh, but we will do this at the end of this uh, uh, webinar, so after the, the next talk. Uh, but you can put in your question during the talks in the ESICM TV chat and we will collect them and I will address them to the speakers uh, after the, the second talk. Uh, with that, I would like to ask uh, Professor Andres Perner um, to tell us how much fluid in septic shock. Please, Anders, tell us. Thanks, Thomas. Um... I would also like to thank the society and the CD section for arranging this opportunity uh, to discuss a, uh, a very important uh, topic. So I have a few contexts of um, interests um, in this area. Importantly, I'm a member of the uh, Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guideline uh, Committee. I was not involved though in, in the issuing of, uh, of the recommendations on, uh, on fluids. Um, so I, I think it's it's important to to have some context first uh, and, and sort of uh, on a more uh, philosophical note, I think it's fair to say that we were at, um, built to survive sepsis and therefore we a lot of uh, the markers that we assess are adaptive markers uh, of uh, sepsis survival and, and therefore uh, potential um, beneficial. Uh, this can obviously be discussed, uh, but I think there is a point uh, to raise that, that some of these markers of adaptations uh, may obviously be risk factors uh, for bad outcomes, several of uh, those uh, on the previous slide are. Um, uh, markers for that, but but that not, does not make them into therapeutic uh, targets uh, themselves. Um, I think we have learned this uh, sort of a bit the hard way. Um, a lot of my training, and and I think a lot of looking back at a lot of the the sort of uh, uh, physiological guidance of uh, of resuscitation around around the. Uh, the uh, oxygen delivery, uh, which is uh, expressed often in, in this formula. Uh, the, the issue now being that, that several of, of these specific uh, parts of, of the formula have been tested in randomized uh, clinical trials, and, and, and some of these trials even combine several of, of these uh, uh, entities, and, and none of these trials have shown benefit. So, so Interventions to elevate either of, of the single variables in the oxygen delivery formula um, have also now failed, uh, which, which at least uh, I think is why we should re reconsider and, and maybe think more of um, the adaptive response uh, rather than these markers being uh, uh, specific uh, therapeutic targets. Um, 
I, I think this this will have uh, uh, we have we will have to have increasing focus on the, on this because intensive care uh, has become uh, increasingly complex. Uh, it's quite expensive, and and we have um, strain on healthcare workers and and will in in the future likely uh, have to be be really uh careful about how we use uh, the nurses time in particular uh because uh, i think the the uh, the the future for us all is that we have to do uh care properly with less uh, qualified staff um and therefore another sort of overarching theme is that simplification of care has rational in itself or turn the other way around if you want to do something more invasive more complicated you have to prove that it benefits uh, the patient uh, and or the uh, healthcare system so on that note i'll turn to the uh, uh, surviving sepsis campaign guideline uh, recommendations on, on on fluid and and this is the uh, uh, the first one as already alluded to uh, the initial recommendation is to give a fixed dose of 30 ml per kilo um, the Compared to the previous iteration of, of the guideline, uh, this has not changed, except that the, the uh, now it's only a suggestion. So, so there is a better coupling between the, the low quality of evidence for, for this recommendation and the wording around it. So, so the guideline now suggests to give 30 ml. It's not a strong recommendation. The, the uh, recommendations for, for further uh, fluid management after that is uh, this week, and, and here's one statement, there's insufficient evidence to make recommendation on a restrictive versus liberal fluid strategy in the first uh, 24 hours. Um, these uh, guidelines of obviously raises some questions, and, and the first one could be if we are to give approximately two liters uh, of fluid to all patients, uh, a relevant question could be how many patients have lost two liters. Uh, I'm, I don't think we know. Uh, and, and I would, would suggest that actually a lot of uh, patients have not uh, lost fluid. They may be vasodilated, but, but fewer, I would say, have, have lost uh, fluid per se. Um, another question that was already touched upon, uh, touched upon by Jean Louis uh, is how many are fluid responses? And, and I'll show the same data as he did from the Adromeda trial. Uh, as stated before, importantly, these patients had already had the 30 ml uh, per kilo. So this is after initial resuscitation. And as already alluded to, within a few hours, very few patients are fluid uh, responsive. Um, as assessed by the methods uh, you just heard about. So, so this, I think, is, is very important data. Um, more questions. So I guess it's fair to say that most clinicians uh, give fluids for quite simple markers of circulatory failure, so being blood pressure, urinary output, or, or lactates. But does IV fluid uh, improve these uh, physiological markers? Uh, there's actually quite limited data on, on that. So we, we did a randomized uh, pilot trial for the classic program um, and randomized 150 patients to fluid restriction or standard care. And there was a clear separation between the, these two groups and fluid volumes. And therefore, we can look for potential uh, physiological effects uh, between these two groups in the first 24 hours. And as you see there, the three preferred uh, perfusion markers for giving fluid did not change uh, between the two groups um, in these 24 hours. Uh, so, so with the very limited um, evidence we, we had for, have for the effects of, uh, of the simple hyperperfusion markers, uh, there appears to be a uh, limited effect. Again, these patients were recruited after the first uh, 30 ml. So, Obviously, the more important question is do higher versus lower fluid volume um, 
improve patients' outcomes. Um, and there are uncertainty, and therefore, luckily, trials are ongoing, at least four of them. The two top ones there have uh, finalized uh, recruitment, so, so we will soon uh, learn more from, uh, from randomized trials in this um, area. Until then, we can look at the systematic review that, that we did as part of the, uh, the classic program led by uh, Tina Meyerhoff. Uh, we identified all randomized trials who had a stated aim of creating separation in fluid volumes uh, in the initial management of, uh, of patients with sepsis. Um, there were nine. Um, Randomized trials uh, included at this time point, uh, so quite homogeneous uh, in characteristics, so most done in septic shock in, uh, in ICU, a total of 620 patients enrolled in all. Uh, they all used uh, fluid restriction as the intervention. Uh, some used fluid responsiveness to op obtain this, others used a fixed trigger for fluid, and then uh, the final one the early use of uh, vasopressor, all done in high-income countries, and all contemporary trials, meaning that they were performed in 15 and, um, and onwards. So, so I think a, a pretty homogeneous um, evidence base, but obviously only 621 patients uh, enrolled altogether. So this is the uh, pooled results for mortality. Uh, the point is to make there um, at the bottom, uh, suggesting a 13% relative um, uh, risk uh, decrease in mortality with the lower fluid volume. Um, these are subgroups. So if we only look at the uh, trials that succeeded in generating fluid separation between the two groups, this, this effect may um, be, um, be somewhat uh, larger, so potentially 19% relative risk uh, decrease in mortality with, with fluid restriction. Neither, obviously, uh, were statistically significant, uh, likely given the uh, small overall sample size. Uh, I'll just highlight the, the largest of these trials, which was our own pilot. Um, Classic trial uh, published a few years ago now uh, in intensive care medicine, a feasibility trial done at multiple centers, randomizing 150 ICU patients with septic shock who had received the initial 30 ml per kilo, uh, being randomized for a protocol restricting all of resuscitation fluid or a protocol aiming at standard care. Here are the um, protocol details, so in, in restriction, you could only have more resuscitation fluid if you had severe hyperperfusion. It wasn't mandated to give these patients fluid, but, but you could only have it if you had a, a high lactate, severe hypertension, uh, mottling, or severe oligoria, but only in the first two hours. Uh, the control group was uh, according to the 2016 Surviving Sepsis Camping Guideline. Fluid losses uh, could be replaced in, in both groups, and we did not allow uh, albumin uh, in this trial. So we, as I said, we created separation between the two groups. So these are percentiles uh, in the two groups. And, and if you accept that, that the fluid volumes uh, given to a group of patients uh, is a marker of disease severity, so we, we sort of created separation or, uh, across the full spectrum of uh, disease uh, severity. The exploratory outcome measures are shown here. They all favor fluid restriction and worsening of AKI did so uh, with statistical um, significant. Together with the, with the systematic review, this formed, uh, at least we thought, a, a good base for, a, uh, for the larger classic trial, now assessing effects of fluid restriction um, on patient important outcome uh, measures in patients with septic shock, uh, 1,500 patients in 32 ICUs uh, in the countries um, you see there. Uh, randomized, uh, we now used uh, the septic shock version 3 criteria and would use the volume uh, that they should have had to only one liter. 
now being a bit more strict, so we restricted all IV fluids, so uh, not only for resuscitation, but for all indications. So that me this means that in the classic uh, trial, after randomization, you could have uh, no more IV fluid unless you had severe hyperperfusion using the markers you saw, then you could have, could have a bolus. It was not mandated. Um, if fluid was locked, you could, or you, you could give it again. It wasn't mandated what was lost, or if you had a uh, planned total fluid input uh, of uh, one liter per day, but this included um, medication and nutrition and, and by, by uh, the vast amount of uh, vast number of ICU patients will receive more than one liter of, uh, in medication and uh, nutrition. Uh, I cannot show you the data, but they will be presented at the critical care reviews meeting uh, on uh, June 17th. If you're not there in Belfast, they will be uh, live, live streamed uh, nine o'clock in the morning, uh, Belfast uh, time. So uh, join either way. It's, it should be uh, pretty interesting, I think. I said a, uh, a sort of repeated observation is that that, uh, that most uh, fluid given in ICU is given for other indications than, uh, than what we discussed here today. So fluid resuscitation, that at least in this uh, um, Belgian study, uh, where only the orange and the red parts up there in the corner represent fluid given for potentially resuscitation, whereas most are given for other indications being maintenance, uh, nutrition, or uh, medications. So, so any interventions uh, done against uh, resuscitation fluid uh, aims at a, a limited uh, volume of, uh, of the overall fluid given to patients. So I, I think, given my points, uh, I at least myself have simplified uh, my use of fluid in, in these patients um, based on the context you saw. I think uh, simplification has rationale in itself. Um, I think we have probably um, looked too much of the markers of adaptation as, um, as uh, intervention, uh, as the targets for intervention, and, and therefore it's worth to remind you that that uh, we retain water and sodium and raise lactate uh, to, to adapt, and that is to survive uh, sepsis. Uh, my statement would be that a few patients uh, have lost fluid and, and a few loses fluid in the ICU. Uh, in any case, most fluids are given uh, with medication and nutrition. Uh, none of the tools uh, used to guide fluid therapy have been shown to improve uh, outcome in, uh, in randomized clinical trials. Um, as you saw, the, the first 30 ml in, in septic shock is uh, the standard of care. And I think it will probably be okay uh, to give this in, in most patients. So pragmatically, I, I would do that. After the initial 30 ml, uh, it becomes a bit more tricky. Uh, I use fluid boluses in the case of uh, marked hyperperfusion, in particular peripheral uh, temperature gradients, modeling, and uh, high lactate and anuria. Anuria only in the first few hours. Um, I stop if I see no improvement in these markers or if the patient uh, shows that he or she cannot uh, tolerate it by worsening oxygenation. With that, uh, thank you again for the CD section uh, for arranging this meeting on, on this uh, important topic, and uh, I'd be happy to discuss uh, uh, this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. Uh, thank you, Jean-Louis, for your excellent talks again. Uh, so now the, the talks are open for discussion. And uh, let me start by picking up some points that come via the talk so there is a um, the concept that we of course might might spare some giving some, some fluids by giving vasopressors early so i would like to to get your thoughts on this uh Anders, the question to you would be 
yes, is it true? Can we really uh, do, do it? And, and should we do this before the 30 ml recommendation uh, is uh, finished? So shall we do it really early? And to Jean-Louis, the same question, how will this affect the test that you use to assess fluid responsiveness? Well, I guess I start. Um, yeah, I, th I think at least personally, I've, I've, I've sort of come to the point where I, if, if I want to raise blood pressure, I give a drug that with high certainty raises blood pressure. And, and that's a vasopressor. And, and, and for me, that would be noradrenaline. So I use noradrenaline to raise blood pressure. Obviously, then, then assessment of hyperperfusion will be very important. It's always very important. So, so I do that. And if the patient is hyperperfused, I'll consider giving a fluid challenge. But, but blood pressure, in my opinion now, should be uh, targeted with a drug that increases blood pressure. And I'm, I'm less and less confident that this is fluid. Can we? Uh, regarding uh, starting vasopressors early, you know my point of view. Uh, you know that uh, when you have a profound hypotension, uh, it is necessary to give vasopressors early because you cannot solve the problem with fluid only. Because when you have profound hypotension, by definition, it is due to vasodilation, it cannot be due to hypovolemia alone. So there is always, uh, in case of profound hypotension, a component of vasodilation. This is why I like to to start early, and I pay attention to the diastolic out of pressure. When it is very low, it is a marker of a, a low vascular tone, and therefore I would consider, consider of course, the use of vasopressors early. And norepinephrine, I fully agree with Anders. Regarding the effects of norepinephrine on the test, because norepinephrine is able also not only to increase at all tone, but also to, uh, to redistribute uh, venous blood from the unstressed to stressed volume. Uh, also, norepinephrine is able to increase uh, preload and to increase venous return through an increase through this uh, redistribution effect. And therefore, of course, if you give norepinephrine, you had less free responsiveness than before, because it is more or less uh, also, uh, it, it can give more or less the same effect as a fluid infusion for this. So it's normal to have less effects. If you use an norepinephrine, you have a lower PPV, you have a less increase in uh, calic output after passive leg raising, et cetera, et cetera. It's not, it, it does not mean that it is, uh, uh, it is, uh, how to say, it can create some confusion. It just acts like uh, preload, how to say, an increase in preload as a fluid infusion does. But on the other side, the atoll side, it has a very good effect on atoll tone because it can increase blood pressure just to be on the on the plateau, I would say, of the outer regulation curve in order to ensure a good perfusion for uh, main uh, vital organs. Okay, thank you. Uh, then I have a couple of questions regarding the, the test that you mentioned, Jean-Louis. Um, maybe we can give some short answers to that. So the first one would be, how do the test characteristics of pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation vary, vary with right ventricular failure? So you mentioned the limitations, but uh, how will this affect the measurement? More, yeah, it is more considered as a limitation of PPV, pulse pressure variation. It was maybe it was when you when we use a uh, high table volume because uh, we had uh, an increase in the in a high increase in transplanary pressure, which is less the case in case of low tidal volume ventilation. So uh, it, it was considered as um, limitation because it can create some uh, false uh, false positive case, meaning high PPV in fluid non-responders. Maybe it was true in the past, because again, we used high tidal volume. I am sure that it is less true with low tidal volume anyway. If you have some doubt about a high PPV value in presence of RV dysfunction, and you are not sure uh, 
that uh, it is a mark of a, a true mark of free responsiveness, I recommend uh, to use passive lag raising and to look at the change in PPV in this case. If PPV decreases with passive lag raising in this case, it could be uh, a good marker of free responsiveness. If PPV does not decrease, could be a false positive PPV. And in this case, you should refrain to give fluids. But again, I, I look at at all curve for, for, for years <laughs> uh, at the bedside. And I, I think it's that it is exceptional to have a low tidal volume ventilation and a high PPV just due to uh, RV dysfunction and not due to, uh, to uh, field responsiveness. In case of Excellent. low tidal volume ventilation again. Next on the inclusion test, um, is there a max which the end expiratory inclusion is no longer predicted answer please sorry can you repeat i i did not is a maximum peep value uh, after which the end expiratory inclusion test is no longer predicted? difficult to answer uh, we we published a paper years ago at least 10 years ago showing that uh, the value of the test uh, does not depend on peep application but we used levels of PEEP around uh, 13 soldiers of water uh, on average. We did not use a very high level like uh, 18 or, or 20, so I cannot answer. But until 13, on average, it, is not, uh, it did not matter. Okay. Then a question maybe to the both of you. Um, what has not been mentioned, do you use uh, sound for some C? Or, or lung ultrasound, B lines to uh, assess or to guide a therapy. Anders, we use lung ultrasound. Does it no. play? No, your 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 connection is uh, is not uh, comp uh, perfect. But but uh, but I understood if if I used uh, specific other tools. No, I I. I use the simplified uh, test that I uh, the, the simplified approach that I um, that I presented. So I don't use any tests. How would you recommend uh, determining the infusion volume for a patient with severe acute pancreatitis? Pancreatitis. Uh, question. <laughs> So your, your question is a bit difficult to hear again, but but uh, for pancreatitis patients, um, yes. I, I would not, I wouldn't treat them any different. Uh, I, I know there is, a, I know there is a strong sort of, um, particularly the surgical literature, a, a strong sort of incentivement to to give these uh, fixed, fixed high uh, fluid volumes. Uh, I find find the evidence uh, and the, the sort of the pathophysiological rationale for this um, less strong. And, and therefore, I do not treat them differently than I do for any other patients. A question maybe, uh, what is the current status of the PCO2 grade? Gradient, venous to material PCO2 gradient as a target of fluid resuscitation? <laughs> uh, so the PCO2 gradient, PCO2 gap, as we say, uh, in general, uh, is a good marker of the adequacy of catacalputo metabolic, con so the metabolic condition of the patient. So if it is high, when PCO2 gap is high, meaning more than six meters of mercury, it means that maybe you can consider an increase in cardiac output, if the patient is in shock, of course. If the patient is not in shock, you consider nothing. If the patient is in shock with a high PC2 gap, it means that maybe you can consider an increase in cardiac output. And therefore, you can guide your treatment. But it is an increase in cardiac output can be due to hypovolemia or due to cardiac contractility. So you have to assess free responsiveness, and you have also to assess cardiac contractility using echo before. Uh, so it is very important. Just a, a point, it is the last, uh, my last slide. Even if the patient is fluid responsive, it's not a reason to give fluids just uh, to give fluid. First, if the patient is not in shock, there is no reason, of course. And second, even if the patient is shocked with uh, 
uh, field responsiveness, you should pay attention to long tolerance, for example. And uh, if you have a, a, a large number of beelines, maybe it could be risky. Uh, so I would, uh, I also pay attention to long tolerance uh, indices, and I like the balance of the benefit uh, risk balance. And uh, I like to assess always the balance before giving any treatment, fluid or any other treatment. I have a question to Anders. When to give albumin? <laughs> You can give it to those who have lost it. Good. If, if you are, have you if you have lost a considerable amount of albumin, you can you can give it. In my opinion, I, I think we've randomized uh, more than ten thousand patients uh, in trials of this, and and none have shown conclusive uh, benefit. So so I would love to do another trial because it's still actually highly used. Uh, Probably one in septic shock, but but for now I don't use albumin. And the next, uh, simple question where we can talk hours for hours about is the question: uh, if you should use ring selected instead of uh, normal sales, uh, it's particularly in view of the new guidelines. So ringers or saline. We'll take a guess on that. So I'll, I'll use ringers uh, for patients with sepsis. Uh, for those who have potential brain pathology, I use saline. And brain pathology would include TBI, meningitis, stroke. And there is a question about should an alternative way to reduce vasodilation in sepsis, like red uh, and blue uh, or in O blocker. To, to reduce the vasodilation? No, I would say uh, vasopressors, of course, can do can do the job. And if norepinephrine is not enough, enough, you can think about the combination with other vasopressors like vasopressin, for example, as recommended by the surviving sepsis campaign anyway. Methylene blue is not an option, uh, except in very, very, very severe cases, but it's not an option, to be honest. But an option is to also to give uh, steroids in order to, to facilitate the response of, of, of vessels to norepinephrine, for example. So uh, there is a place, I think, for steroids in case of very, very severe vasodilation. OK, thank you very much. I get a sign from. Uh... Uh, uh, that we are uh, over time, so we have to end this webinar. Thank you very much, uh, both uh, speakers, for your ex talks, for your excellent discussion, and thanks, Vascular Dynamics section of the ESICM, for organizing this, especially Xavier Mone, and uh, for listening. And uh, hope to see you again uh, at the next webinars. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.